Jesus just absolutely defeated the devil at every turn. And what I want to do on this tape is talk about spiritual warfare and about dealing with the devil and overcoming his hindrances to what God has already provided. Because today there has been a big emphasis on spiritual warfare. Satan does exist. There is evil in this world. There are demonic forces that are fighting against God. And prior to the last maybe 10 years, 15, 20 years, the body of Christ as a whole has been very ignorant of Satan's devices. Many people believe that all of the devils were over in Africa in some third world undeveloped country, but they didn't believe that in any of the western countries, in any of the developed civilized countries, that there was such a thing as demonic activity. And over the last two decades, I think that has been shattered, especially among charismatics. There's probably still evangelicals and some of the mainline denominational churches that still are ignorant of Satan and his existence and believe that that stuff uh, doesn't really have much of an impact. But anybody who really believes the Word of God has to acknowledge that Satan is a real foe. Satan tempted Jesus. Satan fought against him his entire ministry. There are many instances where Jesus healed people and by casting demons out of them. Uh, there's many instances, like one of the clear instances in Scripture is Acts chapter 10, verse 38, where it says that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with power, who went about doing good, healing all that were oppressed of the devil. It makes it very, very clear that sickness was an oppression of the devil. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that, but Satan does exist. There are demonic powers, and I think that it was good that it has come to the forefront that that we are in a spiritual battle. But in the process, I think that uh, much of the body of Christ has gone to an extreme. I mean, a very, very weird, far extreme in spiritual warfare, and in doing so has actually imparted to the devil powers and abilities that he doesn't really have. And so on this tape, uh, we are going to be dealing with that. Satan is a factor. He does hinder what God has already done in the spiritual realm from manifesting in the physical realm. And so we're going to deal with that and talk about taking our authority over the devil. But I want to make it very clear that uh, Satan is basically a defeated foe. And the only reason that he's able to do anything is because of our own ignorance. Just like Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11, that uh, he wasn't ignorant of, of Satan's devices. The body of Christ today has been ignorant. Now, they have come to the knowledge as a whole that Satan exists, but then they've imputed unto him powers and ability that he doesn't really have. Let me just start over here in Ephesians chapter 6. And the book of Ephesians is a book that we've used throughout this entire teaching. And again, I say that it was written from the standpoint of everything has already been done. And therefore, it's a matter of us just possessing what God has already given us, not trying to get God to give us something new. And the book of Ephesians is written from that standpoint. So in the sixth chapter, he's kind of winding down. This is the last chapter. In Let me just letter. start over here in Ephesians chapter the 6. Ephesians. And in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10, he says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. He goes on to say in verse 12, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. So these two verses make it very clear that we are in a battle. People who don't believe that we are in a battle are, are destined to lose it. But let me make a clear line of distinction here, and this may offend a number of people, but I ask you to follow through with what I'm saying, listen to these scriptures, and then draw your conclusions from what the Word says, not just from current teaching in the body of Christ, current examples and things like this. We are in a battle. But the battle is not 
out there in the heavenly places. Now, we are fighting demonic powers, yes, and they exist in the heavenly places, spiritual wickedness, but the battle is right between your ears. Notice in verse 11, he says, Take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. The word wiles here means lies, deception, cunningness, craftiness. All of these words are implying that Satan's only power is deception. Satan does not have actual power to be able to force anyone to do anything. Satan really is a non-factor. Now, I'm going to be establishing this in a lot of other scriptures, but let me just make some statements. Again, I challenge you to follow through and listen until I get to the scriptures that will verify these things. Don't just turn this off because it's contrary to uh, popular theology today. But Satan is an absolutely defeated foe. He has zero power to destroy anybody, to keep people in bondage. He has no power to do anything whatsoever. Satan's only power is deception, wiles, cunningness, craftiness, lies, deception of the devil. It says over in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul was talking to the Corinthians, and of course those of you that are familiar with the uh, context of this statement will recognize that the Corinthians had fallen into some terrible things. They were uh, doing all kinds of weird things. Paul rebuked them pretty soundly. But he said in verse 3, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3, I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Now notice here, he says that the way Satan is going to come against you is through subtlety, which once again is implying deceptive practices, deceit, wiles of the devil, it's consistent, and he says here that the way Satan comes against us is through the simplicity that's in the gospel. In other words, we're trying to make it harder than what it really is. You can trace this all the way back to the book of Genesis, and you can find in Genesis chapter 3 that it says that the serpent came against Eve, and the serpent was the most subtle animal on the face of the earth. Why didn't the devil take a, a mammoth? or an elephant, or a tiger, or a lion, or something to intimidate Eve? Why didn't he have a mammoth just stick his foot on top of Eve's head and say, why don't you eat of this fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, or I'll crush your head? Well, see, Satan didn't do that, because he had no power to force or intimidate Adam and Eve into anything. Instead, he had to come and deceive them. The way he started the deception was by saying, has God really said? And he challenged the word of God. In other words, the truth, the truth of God's word is the thing that allows us to yield to God, to follow through, to seek him, and to resist the devil. And if Satan didn't challenge the word and get them to second guess and to question the word, well, then that temptation would have gone nowhere. The serpent didn't come and force them, didn't intimidate them, but instead deceive them. But in that, you'll find out that he tempted Adam and Eve with something they already had. He says, don't you want to be like God? The truth was they were already like God. They were more like God before they ate of the fruit than they were after they ate of the fruit. That's a very good parallel to what I've been talking about. Satan is trying to say, oh, sure, God loves the world, but what makes you think he loves you? And he gets you into feelings and in trying in some physical way to discern whether or not God loves you. And so you get into the physical realm instead of understanding that in the spiritual realm it's a done deal. And because you don't feel love, because you don't have a goose bump, you get into unbelief and say, oh God, please pour out your love in my life. And that's actually a prayer of unbelief. You know, Satan loves to keep people from coming to the Lord. But if he can't keep you from coming to the Lord, which he can't, I mean, stop and think about it. You were at your very worst. If you were ever going to be weak, if you were ever going to fail in anything, you should have failed in getting born again because you hadn't been going to church. You hadn't fasted. You hadn't prayed. You hadn't studied the word. You weren't living right. Many of you were whoremongers, adulterers, dope addicts, whatever, mean, selfish. And in that state, 
You called out and received the greatest miracle that you could ever receive. If Satan was who he claimed to be, then he would have kept you from getting saved instead of after you get saved saying you didn't get it, you didn't get it. He can't stop you from doing anything. Now, he would rather keep you away from God. But if he can't keep you from coming to God, then the next best thing is to make you say, oh, sure, God can do these things, but he hasn't done them yet. And Satan loves to do that. And so Satan is doing the same thing today. He's coming to Christians and is basically saying, if you were really a great Christian, how come you aren't doing this and doing that? And he will condemn you over what you don't have and try and keep you focused on just the physical realm. But the truth is, in the spiritual realm, you do have everything. And as it says in Philemon chapter 1, verse 6, it says, The communication of your faith becomes effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. The way you get your faith to work is when you start acknowledging the good things that are in you. Many Christians today are saying there isn't any good thing in me. You know, Paul said this over in Romans chapter 7. He says, I know that in me, and then he puts in parentheses, that is, in my flesh, dwells no good thing. Now, if he hadn't put that parentheses in there, it wouldn't have been a true statement because in him dwelt God and everything that God is and everything that God had given him, and it was all good. But see, he specified, he says, in my flesh, in other words, my physical, carnal self, not my born-again self, but in my flesh, there's no good thing. Well, it's okay if a Christian acknowledges and understands that without Christ, we are nothing. But in Christ, we can do all things. In Christ, there are good things. And we have to be focused on who we are in Christ. And this is where Satan's warfare is aimed. It is aimed against you understanding and acknowledging who you are and what you have in Christ. It is lies. It's deception. Satan doesn't have any more power to make you fail in any area of your life than he had to make Adam and Eve fail. Instead, he has to deceive us. Now stop and think about this. If you were the devil and if you were trying to deceive perfect people, Adam and Eve, who had never sinned, who had never had any kind of problems, who were living in paradise where everything was perfect. The temperature was just right. All of their food was provided. There were no problems in the world. There was no bad news on every day. How, how could he tempt them? He couldn't tempt them with money. There wasn't such a thing as money. Every need was supplied. Everything was abundant. He couldn't tempt them with adultery. There was no one else to commit adultery with. He couldn't tempt them with bitterness and hurt and pain over past experiences and living in the past and being depressed or discouraged. There was none of those things. How do you tempt perfect people? You can't tempt them with money. You can't tempt them with sex. You can't tempt them with power, with pride, with arrogance, with glory, fame. There was none of those things. How do you tempt... situation like that so you know that's really a difficult thing and what he chose to do was come and say well as good as it is there's more and you don't have it all the truth is they did have it all and he got them to speculating about what might be what could be and he caused perfect people perfect people living in perfection with zero problems which most people today would give anything to live in that situation these perfect people threw it all away because a talking snake convinced them that they didn't have enough. 
if you could con- convince perfect people who had zero physical problems, zero reason to ever question and doubt the goodness of God, if you could convince people living in paradise, in perfection, that they didn't have it all, then I can guarantee you that you can convince people living in a fallen world who can open their eyes and look in any direction and see pain and tragedy and lack and need, then you can convince those people that they don't have it all. But the truth is that those of you who've been born again do have everything. You are complete in Christ Jesus. Everything has been given unto you, and you are not fighting against some demonic power who has superior power, superior authority that you have to stand and fight against. But instead, all you're doing is fighting against his lies, his deceptions, the same lies and deceptions that he used on Adam and Eve. But here in Ephesians chapter 6, notice he's talking about a warfare. Yes, we are in a war, but what's the war about? The warfare isn't in heavenly places way out there somewhere, but instead it's right between your ears. The battle against the devil is waged in your thoughts. And this is the reason that God's word is essential. That's the reason that John chapter 8 says, You shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Because truth is the antidote for deception. And Satan's only power is deception. He has lied to us and told us that he's powerful and we have misrepresented things. And we actually have caused many people to submit to Satan because they think, after all, you know, look how powerful he is. Satan has zero power. His only power is lies and deception. If we know the truth, the truth will set us free. Let me share another passage of Scripture with you on spiritual warfare. I've already used a couple here out of 2 Corinthians chapter 2 talking about, you know, we aren't ignorant of his devices. That shows that the the uh, antidote, the weapon against Satan is actually uh, truth. Truth is what sets you free. John chapter 8, we used Ephesians chapter 6 about standing against the wiles of the devil. Listen to this passage of Scripture in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. And in verse 3, he says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. Here he is talking about a warfare, a spiritual warfare. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing uh, into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Now, here again is another passage on warfare. Notice that it's talking about our warfare, but then in verse 4 it says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God, to the pulling down of strongholds. Verse 5, casting down imaginations. That is a process of your mind, your imagination, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. These verses are saying that our warfares, our warfare, our weapons of our warfare are against thoughts, imaginations, knowledge that comes against the word of God. Once again, there is spiritual warfare. I agree with that 100%. But the warfare is against Satan's lies and deception. He has no power. Most Christians believe that Satan does have a huge power, a tremendous power, much greater power and authority than physical human beings. That is not true. Satan is a defeated foe. He's been beaten, but he goes about, as it says over in 1 Peter chapter 5, it says he goes about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He is not a true lion. He's just as a roaring lion. Satan tries to intimidate the body of Christ, but the truth is he has had his teeth pulled. All he could do is gum you. He can't do anything. Satan is powerless. Satan does not have the ability to steal anything from you unless you believe his lie, his deception. And if you empower him and give him more power and authority than he's worth, then he uses your power against you. He uses your fear, your unbelief, your terror to oppress and destroy you. 
And so, yes, Satan is a factor. And I believe that there are people that are literally having Satan eat their lunch and pop the bag, but it's not because he is greater in authority and power. It's because he deceives them and they yield to him through fear. And they actually empower the devil by doing that. Now, I was raised in a denomination that believed all of the demons were over in Africa. And they didn't believe that, you know, there were such things as demons. It was a non issue. It wasn't even practical to talk about it. But as I got to reading the word, it just jumped out at me and the Holy Spirit showed me that there was a lot of problems, especially sicknesses and emotional problems that were demonic in origin. And I started praying for people and I started seeing people delivered. We saw people come off drugs instantly with no withdrawal who had been addicted to it before. We began to start seeing people delivered of things. And we begin to start seeing great success. And I just resolved right then. I said, you know what? I have been giving the devil too much place. I began to study the word and find out that that's the way that Jesus did it. And I began to get a lot bolder. During that same period of time, uh, there was so much demonic stuff going on. People who were demon-possessed coming to us that our... focus was on the devil. We were constantly talking about the devil. I actually found myself one time, I would spend anywhere from two to three or four hours a day in prayer. And I found myself one time spending more time talking to the devil in quote unquote prayer than I did God. And you know, that bothered me. I said, God, I'm spending more time addressing the devil when I pray than I do you. And I knew something was wrong with that. There's a lot of people who are into this weird type of spiritual warfare that their whole prayer life is all about binding the devil and rebuking it. And they call it prayer, but they're actually talking and addressing the devil. Something is wrong with that. I begin to recognize this. And the Lord showed this to me, and I realized that I had glorified the devil and given him more power than he was worth. And I saw that. I repented of it. I rebuked it. And from that time on, I said, you know, the best defense is a good offense. And I'm going to be so bold, praising God, worshiping God, focusing on God, that I believe that by being focused on God, it's going to destroy Satan's inroad into my life. And I'm telling you, brothers and sisters, that this is happening over and over and over in the body of Christ today. We have given the devil way too much credit. Satan is a factor he is going about seeking whom he may devour, but the only reason he can do anything against any person is because they empower him through their fear. And a lot of what is being taught, spiritual warfare today, is ascribing to the devil more power, more authority than he really has. He has zero power, zero authority. His only power is deception. And by spiritual warfare conferences, ascribing to the devil this great power and talking about principalities that rule over places and demons that have to be bound before anything can happen and stuff, they are presenting things contrary to what the Word of God presents. And it's actually causing many people to yield to the power of the devil. Let me show you another passage of Scripture in Colossians chapter 2. And this is just powerful. This is really great. Colossians chapter 2, in verse 13, he says, And you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of, his, out of the way, nailing it to his cross. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Man, that is powerful. Especially verse 15, it says, And having spoiled principalities and powers. The word spoil here 
is is used in the sense uh, not like when you say that fruit spoils, meat spoils, where it turns rotten, but rather it's talking about in the venue of conquest. You go out and conquer your enemy, and then you take the spoils. You spoil them. You take from them everything that is of value. Satan has been spoiled principalities and powers have been spoiled. They were stripped of all authority, all power. Satan was the God of this world who had power and authority. Jesus stripped him of that. He has been spoiled. He doesn't have any power and authority. His only weapon is deception. And then if you yield to him, he uses your power, your authority to overcome you. So it says in verse 15 that he spoiled principalities and powers and made a show of them openly. This word show, if you study it in the Greek, it's literally the same word that we get exhibition from or exhibit. In other words, God exhibited, made an exhibition out of Satan. And that's the way I see the devil. He has been impaled on the cross through, you know, the spikes that hung Jesus on the cross. He's now nailed to the cross. He's an exhibit, stripped. He has nothing. He has been made a show of, an exhibition. And then the last phrase in that verse, it says that he triumphed over them in it. If you look this word up, the Greek phrase or the Greek word that was translated by this phrase, triumphing over them, is it's a word that literally was referring to a triumphant procession. It's talking about to just literally display, uh, and it is referring to a custom that the Romans had, that when they went out and fought an enemy, uh, they would go out, and if they conquered their enemy, they would bring them back and have a parade. Now, if they didn't conquer the enemy, then they wouldn't have this parade. And the problem here was that all of the Roman citizens who had been terrorized by this foreign power, this opposition force, the enemy, uh, if they didn't have a parade, if the enemy wasn't conquered, well, then there was still fear in their life. There was still anxiety. There was still worry and care about, is he going to come back? Is he going to conquer? They may have won a battle, but if they didn't conquer the king, the opposing general, and have this parade, well, then... Maybe he could marshal his forces again. There was reason for doubt and questions and worry. But when they conquered the enemy, they would take this either general or the king, the opposing force, and they'd either kill him and bring his head and his body so that everybody could see, or what they preferred was to literally capture him alive. They would strip him totally naked so that he wouldn't have any, you know, uh, Uh, garments on him that would make him look kingly important. He wouldn't have any armor on that would make him look, uh, you know, as as if he was strong. But instead, they would see him absolutely stripped naked. They would tie him to a chariot or to a horse and either have him walk or drag him through the streets. And they would also cut off the uh, both thumbs and both big toes so that he could never again hold a sword, that he could never again stand in battle. And they would parade him through the streets and they would show all of the Romans that your enemy is conquered. They would do this. They preferred to do it that way because that way it took care of all worry, all fear, all questions about whether this guy was ever going to be able to mount a campaign or not. They had a parade and literally displayed him in a way that the the citizens would mock him, spit on him, beat him do things like this, and it would totally take away their fear of this king or of this general. And that was the purpose of the parade. And, you know, basically this is what this is saying, is that Jesus did the same thing to the devil. Through these scriptures that we've already talked about, Jesus just absolutely defeated the devil at every turn. It says over in Hebrews chapter 2 that he destroyed him who had the power of death, that is the devil, so that he could deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. Now how clear can you make it? He destroyed him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and delivered them who through fear of death. See, Satan didn't have the power. It was the fear of death. It's the wiles of the devil. It's the deception that he comes against people with. And he delivered us from this. 
There has been a parade. There is this triumphant procession where Satan has been paraded through the scriptures and shown to be an absolute zero with the rim knocked off. He's a nothing. But the problem is the body of Christ missed the parade. As a whole, especially spiritual warfare people, they are getting it right that yes, there is a warfare, and yes, Satan is alive, and yes, Satan is a factor. But where they're missing it is they're saying he's a factor because he has great power and great authority. No, he doesn't. He has great ability to deceive and lie, and we have to stand against the wiles of the devil. We need to know the truth. We need to be focused on God and not focused on demons. And yes, there's a battle, but I tell you, most as a whole, the spiritual warfare movement has glorified the devil, has given them, they've missed the parade. They are ascribing to the devil more power than he deserves. Some examples of what I'm talking about in the spiritual warfare thing, there is a great movement that before you can go into an area and be effective preaching the gospel, you have to have what they call uh, you know, different terminologies have been used, but the ones I'm familiar with are you have to have spiritual mapping, which means you have to know what the background of that area is. You have to know what demonic things have gone on in the past. You have to research it. You have to understand what the strongholds are through this. And then you have to send in intercessors. And these intercessors spend months, years, decades praying, rebuking, binding spiritual powers so that the Word of God can have its impact. Let me just say this as bluntly as I possibly can. There is zero, zero precedent for that in the Word of God. You cannot find that anywhere in God's Word. That is absolutely wrong. Now, am I saying that there aren't demonic powers? No, that's not what I'm saying. I believe that there are demonic powers, and I believe that there is a hierarchy of demons, that there are spiritual wickedness, there are demons assigned to places, to areas, and I believe that those things exist. But you know what? Paul never sent anybody in to pray and to bind and prepare the place so that the Word of God could go forth. No, the Word of God, the truth, is what sets man free. John chapter 8, and it is... An, a wrong application for us to preach that the reason there isn't more people being born again and set free is because we haven't prayed enough and we haven't done spiritual warfare. Jesus never appointed people to go into the cities before him and pray. Now, he did send his disciples into the cities to promote, to let the people know he was coming so that the crowds would be there. He sent them forth to do miracles and to draw people Paul never sent people forth. Peter never did those things. There is zero scriptural precedent for this. The whole spiritual warfare movement, the way that it is glorifying that, you know, intercessors have to stand here and bind all of these demonic powers and intercede, it is absolutely wrong. Now, you will find things like over in Genesis, I believe it's chapter 18 or chapter 19, where Abraham interceded for the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. And you will find people interceding like that and asking God to have mercy. But that is different than uh, what is being done today. And even at that, I'm not going to go into all of this. I've got that on that tape set entitled Spiritual Authority. But there is a huge difference between what happened in the Old Testament and what happens in the New Testament. In the Old Testament, God had not yet made an atonement for our sins. Jesus had not gone to hell for us. He had not become our intercessor for us. And so it was appropriate to ask for mercy because mercy wasn't totally given. It was being shown, but it was like it was on credit. It wasn't an actual trans transaction. The atonement hadn't been made. But this side of the cross, there is a huge difference between the way we relate to God today. God is now pouring out mercy and grace. As it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, he is not imputing man's sins unto them. And for us to think that there is still an angry God up there who is ready to judge this nation, and unless we repent, unless the intercessors beg and plead with God to stay your wrath and to repent of the evil that you've done or that you're thinking of doing, that is absolutely wrong. Jesus has already atoned for us. He is the intercessor to end all of that type of intercession. 
Now, there is a godly type of intercession today, but it's just simply saying, Father, I know that you're a good God, that you love us. You would have spared Sodom and Gomorrah if there would have only been 10 righteous. There's more than 10 righteous in this country. Thank you that you don't want to judge us. All of these prophecies of doom and unless we do this and that, God is going to destroy us. That is not God. Don't misunderstand me. There are consequences. When people are God-haters and quit seeking God, they become mean and selfish and crime escalates and problems and terrorist attacks and terrible things happen. But that's just sowing and reaping. That's different than God judging. God is not bringing his judgment on people in this day and age. There's coming a time when he will, and he will be just in doing it. But during the church age, he is releasing mercy. And the New Testament intercessor is not begging God to turn from his wrath as Moses did in Exodus chapter 32, because God has already turned from his wrath when Jesus made an atonement for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. He has now turned from his wrath, and God is extending mercy and grace unto people. And for a New Testament intercessor to stand there and, and tell God to repent, as Moses did, is wrong. Now, Moses wasn't wrong in doing it because there was a dispensation of when God was pouring out his wrath. But we are living in a day and age where he says that God was in Christ, not imputing man's sins unto them, but reconciling them unto himself. And for a New Testament intercessor to tell God to repent, to tell God to move, oh God, please pour out your power, all of those kind of things are denying the intercession and the atonement of the Lord Jesus. And you need to understand that there is a difference between the way intercession was done in the Old Testament and the way it's done in the New Testament. And much of what is being taught today in spiritual warfare is absolutely Old Testament mentality. It is anti-Christ. It is denying the fact that Jesus destroyed him who had the power of the devil. It is glorifying the devil. Basically, it's just people who missed the parade. The way I believe that we should do spiritual warfare on a personal level, what you do is you resist the lies and the deception of the devil. And you do that primarily by knowing the truth. Again, John chapter 8, verse 32, and you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. And so it's the truth. Understanding the truth is the greatest antidote for deception. The strength, the power of deception is the fact that you don't know you're deceived. You don't know what the truth is. The moment you have a proper standard, the truth, well then, immediately, deception's lost its power. You know, if a person was terrorized thinking that somebody's going to come kill me, they've threatened to kill me, and then if you could somehow or another produce the corpse of the person who had threatened them, well then, that, that fear, that intimidation would be gone once they know the truth, once they know that they were no longer a problem. Well, see, that's the greatest antidote we have is the Word. On a personal level, I just take the Word of God. I meditate in it. I love God. I fellowship with God. I fellowship with God's people. And I stay positive, seeking God. And by doing so, that is a tremendous, tremendous weapon against the devil. Praise is a very powerful weapon against the devil. It literally drives him out. He can't abide praise. And so on a personal level, I spend very little time, very little time. I mean, I don't, I'm just pulling this off the top of my head, but maybe once a month, maybe once every couple of months, I rebuke and bind the devil over something. And the only reason I do it then is not because he has power that is just coming against me. It's just because the warfare in my mind, in my thoughts has become so intense that I just verbalize it and I speak it out and say, I rebuke these thoughts. Satan, you have zero right over me. And I'll rebuke and say those things out loud. But most of the time, I don't even have to say it out loud. I just counter it by the truth. Now, that could change if you are in a situation where you have been dominated by the devil for a long time. If you're demon-possessed and are trying to come out of it, you might have to emphasize and rebuke and speak to things more. But once you're free, it's fairly easy to keep that freedom by just staying in the truth. And anytime you recognize something that has risen up, that has caused you problems because you believed a lie, then you just speak it out and rebuke it, and it's done. That's on a personal level. When it comes to dealing with other people, but when I see a person who is demonized, who has demonic problems, used to, I would just want to go cast those things out. 
I've come to realize now that if I take authority over them and cast them out just on my faith, well, then those things are going to come back on that person. And in some ways, I'm doing them a disservice because Jesus talked about that if you cast the demon out, he wants to come back with seven spirits worse than himself. And the last state is worse than the first. I've come to realize that the best way to get a person delivered is to tell them the truth, to tell them about how Jesus has promised them victory, to instruct them, to teach them in the word of God. And if you'll do that, most of the time, if a person will just listen to me preach the truth to them and tell them the truth, the demons leave without me even having to rebuke them. I could give you hundreds of examples of that. I mean severe demon possession where people were totally non-functional. And yet when they, they sat and listened to the truth, they were delivered before I could even pray for them. There are some times... And I don't understand all of this, but I guess it's just the inroads that Satan has into a person's personality, into their mind or whatever. He's so ingrained in them that even when a person sees and embraces the truth, they still need someone else to pray and rebuke it. And so there are times I cast peep demons out of people, especially when I'm praying for sickness and depression and things like that. And I see people delivered. But I wouldn't do it without imparting to them some truth also. Because they need to protect themselves, not only get the devil out, but keep him out. I actually believe that the way spiritual warfare has been presented today, to where it's encouraging people not to preach the gospel, not to tell the truth, but just to pray, I believe that that's actually a ploy of the devil. And some people will take great offense at that and say, how could it be the devil that wants you to pray? Well, the devil inspired the scribes and the Pharisees and the hypocrites to sound trumpets and to pray on the street corners to do all of these religious things. That religion has always been demonic. I'm not talking about true Christianity, but I'm just talking about religious observance. Religion is one of Satan's biggest strongholds. If you think that Satan would never encourage people to just pray, well, then you're, you're just sadly mistaken. You don't know your church history. I believe that Satan loves to get people to go through spiritual calisthenics and do all of these things that look impressive and yet have no power to it. The, fo the focus of Christians should be on preaching the gospel, getting the truth out. Actually, it's not a matter of either preaching or praying. It should be done in combination. But, but prayer, intercession, is like water to a seed. If the seed is planted in the ground, then it needs to be watered and fertilized. But you can water and fertilize barren ground and nothing will come of it. You have to plant the seed. That People are born again by the incorruptible seed of the word of God. And if people go forth, you can do like Paul says, pray for me that utterance may be given unto me. Then I may speak the word with all boldness. He didn't pray Pray that the people's ears will be open to hear. Pray that the demonic powers will leave. Pray that Diana of the Ephesians will cease to be a factor. He never encouraged people to do that. When he asked people to pray for him, he asked people to pray that he would speak with revelation, with authority, with power, that miracles would be done, those kind of things. Yes, prayer, intercession is an important part of the gospel, but not the way it's being done today. It's been substituted for the preaching of the gospel. And that is absolutely wrong. But I'm telling you, Satan is a factor. And yes, there is, God has already done everything and has given us everything in the spiritual world. But we are fighting a war. But how is that war, war fought? Is it in the heavenlies? Do we have to do like some of these spiritual warfare people where they rent planes so they can get up and do battle with spiritual wickedness in high places? Do we have to go up to the top of buildings? Do we have to send people around the world and send them to foreign countries so that they can do battle over there? You know, if those demonic powers were really the force that people claim that they are, you don't have to rent a plane and get up close to them. It's not like our prayers only work within a 100-yard radius, that you have to send people to foreign countries to get that accomplished. That's not so. If it was true, you could stand right here and just bind them from where you are. Prayer is that powerful. But no, you don't have to do that. That's not what Paul did. You know what you do? You preach the gospel. You tell people the truth. You go on radio and television. You train people. You send people out. You have churches started everywhere. You preach the gospel. The emphasis is on the word of God. And I tell you, the emphasis hasn't been on the word of God with most spiritual warfare people. 
They get into all kinds of weirdness. Am I against spiritual warfare? No. Am I against intercession? No. I'm just against the weirdness that is being called that stuff today. And I tell you, there needs to be a re-examining by the body of Christ. Satan is a factor, but only because he's going about seeking whom he may devour, who he can deceive. And he is a factor because there are so many people deceived who are empowering him and promoting his doctrines. If we would preach the truth, if you would find out the truth, then I tell you, Satan is reduced to nothing. But there is so much error, not only in the world, but in the body of Christ, that until we go home to be with the Lord, I think that you will have to be doing spiritual warfare. You will have to be fighting against the lies, the deception of the devil. You will have to be renewing your mind. I don't believe any of us have got it all figured out. Yes, there are things we are fighting, and yes, spiritual warfare is real. But it is not because Satan has all this power. It's because he's deceived so many people. And the antidote is not intercession and binding demonic powers and getting millions of people to pray. But instead, the answer is in getting the truth out to people and getting people set free. I'm telling you that God has already been appeased. Revival, people's lives being changed, people seeking God and being sensitive to God, the power that it takes to accomplish that was released through the Lord Jesus Christ, and it has been here on the earth forever. It's just people who aren't receiving it. We don't need to plead with God for revival we need to believe what God has already done. Stand up. Go to raising people from the dead. Seeing miracles happen. And as we do this, then I guarantee you, you will see the effects of revival. You will have all the revival that you can handle. I'm for revival. I am. I believe for revival, but I believe it's going to come as people yield to God, not as we twist God's arm more through intercession and through spiritual warfare. I tell you, these truths right here, are so contrary to the mainstream theology in the body of Christ today that I know many people may reject what I've said just because it's kind of a lonely voice. It's not the only one, but there's few who are preaching this. But I challenge you to take the Word of God, to look at the atonement of Jesus, to follow the example of the book of Acts, and you can't find spiritual warfare done as it is being promoted today. Satan is a factor. But he is not the factor that he has been made to be by people who have missed the parade. I challenge you to take the word of God, find this triumphant procession, see Satan stripped, defeated. And once you see him that way, you will never again fear him. You'll never again cow to him and be intimidated by him the way that you have in the past. And you will be free to set other people free. I tell you, this will help you. Praise God. Father, I just believe that you give revelation and that the truth of your word is set people free. For anybody who has been destroyed, who has been under the thumb, they may still be under the thumb of the devil. I speak the truth, and I believe that the truth is going to set them free, that they will stand up and refuse to allow the devil to steal from them physically, financially, emotionally, in any area, that, Father, an anger will rise up on the inside not at you, but at the devil who has deceived them and lied and that they will resist him and that he will flee from them. Father, I thank you and I believe that you are doing that and we agree and receive miraculous deliverance in the mighty name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.